Okay. Welcome back, Tricia. Hi, everybody. Hi. So, um, Tricia, tell us about your um, role, um, professional standards, and um, what exactly the professional standards committee does, who's on it, and what are the requirements to be on it? So, I, I chair professional standards. I've been doing it for eight years uh, at our board, and I'm also the vice chair at the state this year for New Jersey Realtors. Basically, we get the case to try. We call it a hearing panel. It's, it's called a hearing, not a case. Um, but once it does not um, go through mediation um, and gets passed up from grievance as being valid, whether they chose to mediate or not, it comes to professional standards. Um, we are one of the few industries that really allows um, our, ourselves, our peers, to judge our own peers. That's not common in other industries, but it is in professional standards in, in the real estate um, industry. One of the things that um, is important to note is that a lot of the decisions, if someone does take it to a, a judicial court afterwards, they come back to what's said and what the facts and findings or the arbit arbitration award, award was. And that most of the times the facts show that they do um, go along with our decisions. So that's important to note. Um, professional standards is compromised. Right now, I think I have about 32 uh, people on the committee. Wendy Smith is the vice chair this year. And we, when we get um, the complaint and the respondent, we make sure that whoever we choose to be on the panels are no, you know, they're not connected. They're not part of the brokerage. We even try to not make it if it's a Coldwell Banker or wall office or Spring Lake office that somebody on Coldwell Banker Manalban can't be on it. We do the same with Remax, even though they're not related. We just don't want to have any conflict of interest. And all um, participants, the complainants and the respondents, are given a tribunal challenge where they can challenge any member. We send them the whole member, Chris sends that out to them. And they're able to challenge any of the uh, committee members. And just, I don't mean to interrupt you, but just so that we, um, everybody understands who's listening. So there's a professional standards committee that's comprised of about how many people right now? About 30. Okay. And then out of that committee, you have people that are qualified to hear a panel. There's three minimum requirements for what they would, you know. Right. The new, the new standards will be at least two years in real estate that they will have to have served on a committee, a grieve the grievance committee for two years or mediation and grievance for two years. Um, and they have to take every year there's a, um, a training offered for professional standards. Um, we had it at our board this year with Diane Disbro. It was very um, enlightening. And every year they have to take this training. And it's important because there are changes to the code of ethics, especially the standards of practices. New things are added. Some things are deleted. And this happens almost every year. So when you have your, your committee and now you have a case that comes before you and you have to choose a panel. How many people are sitting on that panel? Because we know that people are not, we want everybody to understand they're not sitting before a committee of 30 people. Right. It's three people. There's a chair person and there's two hearing panelists. Okay. Whether it's ethics or arbitration. Okay. And who's choosing the panel or how is that panel being chosen? The chair and the vice chair. Choose okay. Them. And how do you guys schedule these um, hearings? Is it, there's there a time period from when you get the case to how long people have to gather evidence? Well, that there's actually, like, so when Chris sends out the um, challenge to the tribunal, he sends out the entire 30 people. Um, and then when that comes back, there's usually a 10 day window, right, Chris? And they have 10 days to get that back to him. Then we choose the panel. We see if anybody was objected to out of our way to make sure that it's a fair panel there's no conflict of interest um and then we choose the panel and then we you know chris will set the he'll, he'll send out available dates that we can have the hearing um because we're still doing for the most part virtual hearings um 
he sends out the dates, even if it was to be done at the board as it's done in the past, they get sent out. We have a script that we go by when we do hear the panel, once a date has been agreed on. And then, okay. you know, the date of the hearing and, and the hearing sometimes can last two days. I've had a few that have lasted, you know, into the second day, um, especially when lawyers are involved. <laughs> So. That was one of my questions at that point. I mean, do you feel that people are usually bringing an attorney to a hearing like this? It depends. Um, it depends on, on, on what the, um, you know, whether it, mostly we see it more with arbitration, but we do see it sometimes with ethics. Um, a lot of times if one side has a lawyer, the other side gets a lawyer, but not all the time. It's their option. So the parties know ahead of time who is going to be bringing whoever to the panel, whether they're bringing oh, witnesses or who if they're bringing an attorney, all that. They're yes. made aware of all that. They are supposed to notify us of, of witnesses within uh, 15 days of the hearing. Sometimes that does not happen. And that's up to the chair of that hearing, whether to allow a witness or not allow a witness. And even if the other side objects to the witness, the chair can still overrule that. Witnesses are only allowed in for a certain segment or whatever, whenever they are going to be speaking, they're not allowed to stay for the whole hearing or hear the whole hearing. They're only allowed in for their part, you know, when they're gonna be um, cross-examined or questioned during the hearing. Um, lawyers, on the other hand, are there for the entire hearing. Um, you have, you actually, as the chair, have to take command and not let the attorneys take over because they have a tendency to do that. And um, it can get dragged out. And, you know, they, they too don't understand sometimes how a professional standards hearing works because there's basically three parts. There's the introduction. There's the script that we follow that all NAR boards follow. It's given to us by NAR, comes down from NJR. Um, it was tweaked a few times, you know, because of uh, the pandemic when we were starting to do uh, virtual hearings and still are. Um, there's three parts. There's the introduction, the complainant and the respondent both first start with a brief outline of their, of their case. Then we have the main portion, which is the presentation of the case. We usually start with the complainant and then go to the respondent. During this time, both sides are allowed to cross-examine each other. The panel is also allowed to ask questions for clarity purposes only. The panel has to be very careful about what they ask so that they're not taking one side versus the other or that it gets skewed that way. So basically the panel can ask for clarification on things that were stated or presented but they cannot ask for things that, you know, don't exist otherwise. Then after the cross-examination is done, we have the conclusion where the complainant and the respondents, you know, compile their closing statements, basically. Um, after that, and, and again, the panel can still ask questions at any time. During the closing statements, there cannot be cross-examination between the complainant and the respondent, however. Um, we offer mediation continually through all through the hearing at any point. Do they want to go out and talk to each other? This does happen sometimes. Sometimes I've never had it where it got resolved, but I've had a few times where they went out two or three times to try to resolve it amongst themselves. We, you know, when it's live, you, they go into a different room when it's not live, you know, we, we have to put them in a chat room together on, on a virtual hearing. So how does that work then? You have somebody from mediation or one of the mediators on standby for these panels where if that were to happen or it's just would happen on another day where no, the parties would just go talk to them. Just between each other. the parties themselves. Okay. And, and, and we do have cases where the brokers want to want to settle, but the agents don't, you know, and the, and usually that's on arbitration, of course. Um, but um, sometimes, you know, like I said, I have never had it happen where they did settle during a professional standards hearing. Um, and at the conclusion, we do ask, we follow a script that at, where we ask each party if they felt that the hearing was conducted professionally and fairly. 
And if they say no to anything, we, we ask them why. And we continue to ask them questions until they agree that it was held fairly, um, you know, on both, on both parties' sides. And then after the conclusion of the hearing, the panel stays together and we go what's called into executive session where we discuss the case amongst ourselves. Um, it's also important to note, I didn't mention this before, but we have an alternate that's also uh, picked to be on a panel. The alternate cannot ask questions during the hearing at all. They are there just in case somebody doesn't show up, somebody gets sick, um, somebody has to leave in an emergency, um, but they are part of the, of the hearing process. And that started a few years ago um, because we had to cancel hearings at the last minute for various reasons. So you guys go through this whole process. Now you're ready to deliver a ruling on it. What happens? How do you notify the parties of the ruling? How long does it usually take you to deliberate? It depends on the um, complexity of the case of the hearing. Arbitration, you know, it, it's, it's basically, um, it's majority rule here. It's, it's the panel of three. If, if both hearing panelists agree on the decision, whether it's arbitration or ethics, the chair doesn't have to you know, be involved in voting, basically. But on so the decision doesn't have to be unanimous. It just has to be no. majority. It just has okay. to be majority, correct. And it's basically, um, there's, in an ethics hearing, we have to write what's called a findings of facts. Findings of facts are where we cite the particular articles and standard of practices that we felt were violated based on the complaint. In the facts of finding, I find it's easier to write a bulleted response um, because if there, whether, whether, whether it's found in favor of the complainant or not found in favor of the complainant and found in favor of the respondent, if it's found in favor of the um, complainant, there's probably going to be some disciplines that are involved. And they can range in anything from um, a letter of reprimand to fines. If it's a repeat violation, the fines are even more, um, are even higher. And with, with that, we cite everything that we felt contributed to our decision on the facts and findings. And that's signed by all hearing panel members and the chair. At Moore, we send this, when there's fines and discipline involved, this goes to our board attorney for review. Um, and that's Barry Goodman from, from most people, um, unless he had a conflict with it initially or, you know, represented one of the other parties somewhere. And, you know, it's um, in arbitration, we just write who deserves the award. It, it's not based on an article. It's not based on anything except for the testimony that was presented and the evidence presented. Okay. So um, now you've decided, you've made your decision. What rights do people have uh, or how does the appeal process work? So the appeal uh, process, which we've had more- And what exactly are they appealing? Let's be clear on that. So in appeals, you can appeal whether it's arbitration or ethics. When it becomes an appeal, um, it, it go, it, we, we change, from going a panel of three to a panel of five. And the five come from the board of directors at Moore. It is, um, again, the same forms get sent out. They can challenge anybody, et cetera. We don't, you know, nobody that's put on the same, you know, uh, brokerage would be on the panel, things like that, which sometimes we have to go to the state to get somebody that, has no knowledge of the person because people do recuse themselves. Also, uh, board of directors, if they feel they know the person in brokerage very well, or they know part of the, you know, we don't know all those factors. Um, you can appeal on arbitration just on that fact, but in ethics, it can only be appealed on three things. 
try the case, number one. Um, the finding of facts are not appealable. You can appeal on procedural deficiency, misinterpretation of the article that was charged in, from the code of ethics, or you can appeal the discipline that was recommended by the hearing panel. Um, once an appeal is he heard, that's the final decision. Whatever they, whether they, the the uh, um, hearing panel of five agree with what was the facts of findings and what the original hearing panel recommended, or they can go back and reduce the discipline if they felt the discipline was too high, you know, was too severe. Um, common common disciplines, just so people know, are almost always we recommend that they take an educational ethics course um, that cannot be um, cannot be uh, part of their CE requirements. It has to be above and beyond that. And they have to show proof within X amount of days um, of doing that. Also, a fine is recommended sometimes. Um, and it can range from 500 to 5,000, depending on the severity you know, of the facts of findings and what the original hearing panel thought was necessary. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'm not seeing too many questions coming in specifically to this. So, um, I think we're I a, I just, yeah, I just had one question for Trisha because I just wanted to make sure it was clear on this. So if, if I'm in front of a professional standards panel and, um, it goes, you know, the ruling is against me and I want to appeal it. If I, if, if I just don't like the findings, like I don't think that you understood my complaint and you didn't agree with what, how I feel. And I think that, you know, somebody else needs to hear this. Is that, is that a justifiable appeal? Or are you saying that, you know, I have no appeal? That you have no, there's no basis for the appeal. I mean, you, all appeals are heard, but you can't retry the case. Okay. And so if I, if, if I do an appeal and I go in front of that five panel, I'm not bringing back my evidence of why I feel that, you know, I was, I was right the first time. No, that's, that's not an appealable issue uh, or, you know, consideration. And you can't bring any new, any new evidence into it also. That's okay. That's so once that, your decision you have opportunity to present your, you know, your evidence at the original hearing panel. So once you make your decision, unless I feel I was, it was done unfairly or there was bias or you didn't, you, per, the, the panel didn't understand the actual article and that it was incorrect. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm it's going to sit where it sits. Correct. Correct. And a lot of times, even when the complaint comes down, there still be, there will be, you know, more than one article charged. I often find that the hearing panel doesn't always feel that, if it's two, maybe they only feel one article was in violation, not both, or you know, one out of three. They, it's not always what comes down from grievance and, does, and doesn't get mediated. Oftentimes, they'll just cite one article or you know, one article and one standard of practice rather than multiple. We had a question um, that was asked if. If at some point, and I don't know if the question means after the hearing, but if, if it's discovered that one side produced misleading information during the arbitration, is that justified for an appeal? It's not because during the original hearing, if misleading information was introduced on the cross-examination, you could refute that, whether you were the complaint nor the respondent. That would be your opportunity to refute that that you know, information was misleading or was wrong or whatever, however you felt or could prove. Okay. And we do introduce evidence. Evidence is introduced during the hearing panel um, quite often. Um, we just mark it as, you know, a new piece of evidence, whether it's from the complaint or the respondent with a C or an R. And what can these fines go up to if somebody is found? So on original... Uh, uh, an original violation up to 5,000 on something where they were disciplined for previously, I believe it's up to 15,000. And you can be, and you can also be suspended, you know, if it's really egregious, 
but the facts and findings are really egregious. You can be suspended. You can lose, you know, membership privileges for a certain amount of a period of time. And that's also one of the penalties. Also, if you don't, uh, once, once we have the, uh, just once the appeal process is done, we ask the board at the board of directors meetings to affirm these decisions. If there's penalties involved, once it's affirmed and they don't pay their penalties, the board can suspend them. Or they don't take the education or follow through on what they're supposed to do. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I asked, I asked Lauren to bring all of our panelists back in. Um, I think we lost a couple of people, but... Um, so I just wanted to see if anybody else had any other questions, please just keep putting them in the chat if you have questions for any of our panelists. Um, thank you, Tricia. Um, thank you, all of you. This has been great and very informative. So um, can any of you share, I know um, Jeannie, you had mentioned um, an advertising issue that came up recently, or can any of you share specifically, or hi, Brian, maybe Brian can help us with some of these too, is what can we tell people that are watching this as far as like, what are more specifically some of the common complaints that we're seeing? So what might be a common advertising complaint that we get about something? Or what might be a common, what are the most common ethics complaints um, that we're seeing as far as what's happening out there so that we know how to avoid them? Anybody? <laughs> Well, with the advertising one that we had, it was actually the language in the listing description okay. um, where it referenced certain things that you are not allowed to reference in a listing description. So for, you know, the brokers, managers out there, it, you know, I know everybody looks at the listing documents, you know, everything has to be signed appropriately, but follow up, look at what your agents are writing. Look what they're putting in their listings um, to make sure that they're not using language or referencing something that is not allowable. Um, and it's very specific in the code of ethics, what you are allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say. And you can even, you know, delve even further into that. And, and you know, NAR and NJR has places where you can go to find descriptions that are allowable and words that are not. Um, and then the other big egregious thing is social media. Um, and, you know, I know that it's, that's very difficult to police as a broker and a manager. Um, but when it's involving one of the listings that your brokerage represents, um, you should be paying very close attention to what your agents are putting out there. Especially oh, if the advertising is coming soon. Yes. I'm going to ask Brian to touch on, because I know a lot of you um, are aware, or hopefully everyone is aware, that we have that um, report violation button on the MLS. So, Brian, if you could just touch on and explain to everybody the difference of when they hit that button on the MLS, that report violation button. First of all, we all know that that's anonymous, so you're not, you know, reporting that and everybody's seeing, oh, I complained about somebody. Please be aware that that is anonymous. Um but what happens to those complaints versus the process that we're talking about here? And, you know, how are they handled differently? I think that's an important differentiation that people need to know. So the complaint button is a button specifically related to the MLS system itself uh, and the content that is contained inside of the MLS, both front end and back end. So when somebody hits that complaint button, it, it automatically triggers a couple of different emails. One comes to us, one goes to whoever the listing agent is. And usually uh, when somebody hits that complaint button, they'll also put in a little narrative of what they think is wrong. Hey, we realize you put walking in here, which is a violation of uh, you know federal uh, housing regulations. You can't put walking because uh, that potentially is discriminatory. Or, hey, we see you put in here the word church or house of worship, which is a disallowed, or um, we see that maybe you put the wrong date in. It's, it's usually those complaints that come that way are usually somebody who's seen something wrong and, and they're really trying to keep everybody out of trouble. It's not generally speaking, those aren't generally speaking complaints that are like, you know, I'm ticked off, I'm mad, I'm upset. They're 
generally speaking, those type of, we just want to order in the marketplace, right? Those, those are different than the complaints that come in through violations, through the violations at Mammoth Ocean Regional Realtor. Most of those violations that come in or are either from consumers or uh, from agents who have seen something in the marketplace. They've seen it on one of the third-party data aggregators like Realtor.com or Zillow. They've seen it on social media, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Um, we're now getting TikTok complaints, right? Um, and they've seen something that violates the rules and regulations or violates the code of ethics. When those come in, staff looks at them to see which one we believe it is. Do we believe it's a violation of the code of ethics or do we believe it's a violation of rules and regulations? And depending on that staff determination sets the course of what happens with that complaint. Okay, thank you. Um, I know a lot of the questions that came up or you know, that some of the issues that come up, you guys had mentioned, relate to procuring cause, especially when it comes to arbitration. So Brian, or can any of you touch on um, just giving us a quick rundown of what determines procuring cause? Because a lot of people don't know that. So, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, uh, Jeannie or, or Suzanne or Tricia probably would be best suited as they've all three sat on a number of those hearings. Um, I do have a, a, a comment to make about that when you're trying or Ellen, Ellen, you weren't on my screen. I'm sorry. Ellen is, is probably a master at that. So when it comes to procuring cause, uh, you know, that's the continual pathway, but go ahead and speak about that. Yeah, who wants to answer that? So procuring cause, which is often asked of a hearing panel to determine there, it's very, it can be very subjective. But there, we, we have a list of questions that we need to know when we determine procuring cause. And basically, it has to do with continued, of course, engagement with the client. Um, at what point was the disengagement? And we don't, if you don't have a buyer's um, agency, signed contract in our state there's a lot of very vari variances that come into play and in some states they do use that a lot more than new jersey for the most part our area in new jersey does not use it um, down by cape may they do use it a little bit more frequently that buyer's agency contract um, that does hold water um, when it comes to a hearing panel but procuring cause really is based on a lot of factors besides just introduction to the property. And believe it or not, a lot of people try to, try, to, try to claim introduction by just sending an email, which is probably the furthest from any kind of actual procuring cause. Trisha, I think that um, one of the things that I've noticed in the past with procuring cause especially is important for everybody to know is that documentation is so crucial. So whether they're text messages, emails, um, uh, even just an outline of the time that you spent over however long it was with that client has always been very crucial uh, because whenever I've seen a procuring cause panel situation, it seems to me that genuinely both parties feel that they have procuring cause like they they really think that there's no way they're going to lose this this uh, decision on both sides equally so it is a really sad situation for one and maybe not so sad for another but I can tell you if you're in that situation you want to make sure that you have a lot of documentation don't just make the assumption that oh I have this because you probably believe you do and you may but the panel might not see it that way based on the evidence. Right, and, and with the buyers being so fickle in the last few years, especially in this market, um, they can be using two agents without either party knowing that they are. I'm so glad you brought that up, Trish, because I would say, because I just so you know, I do, I am on uh, that committee. One of the things that I would say more than anything to everybody listening is that I would say 99% of the time, it is usually the buyers that 
that cause the situation, not agents that are trying to do something hurtful or to steal somebody's client. It's usually two agents that have no idea that that buyer is working with several agents. That's and one of the, the yeah. Right. And when they go to make the decision, they usually go to the realtor they feel that's going to get them the deal. Yes. The buyer. And that's one of the benefits of mediation um, because you can't file until the property is closed. So the commission's already gone. It's already been paid out. Um, now you come and you file your complaint then the respondent sends in their response. Um, and to your point, Dawn, I've seen 40 page documents um, with text messages, emails, uh, you know, all kinds of correspondence um, on both sides. But when you sort of unveil all of it and sort of get to the root of where it all unfolded, it 99% of the time it comes down to the general public. The buyer did something, you know, and went astray um, without one or both of the agents knowing about it. And with mediation, you can figure out a way to resolve that so that both parties walk away with something um, and feel, you know, that at least, you know, whatever efforts that they put towards this particular buyer are now being somewhat rewarded as opposed to going directly to professional standards and having one person win the award and the other person walking away. Right. Jean, you brought up the great... Oh, I'm sorry, okay. I just want to, you brought up a great point um, that we need to also clarify is that when you are in a situation of arbitration, you have to let the, the uh, contract move forward, regardless of whether or not you feel you have procuring cause. We cannot stop the process of the purchase. That's so right. if anybody, if wants to touch on that a little bit more specific, we'd love to hear it. Well, you can't, we, we don't even have a hearing panel on arbitration or it doesn't even go through grievance until the property is closed. Right. But if, 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 the, if that buyer is not willing to work with you to the closing table and they chose to work with the opposing agent, you need to let that process That's work itself happens. to the closing mm -hmm. table. You cannot, get, you cannot stop it. No, you need to step away. You need to let yeah, the let me, process happen and step away. <laughs> yeah, so let me just uh, close on that and just a couple of things that's specifically about procuring cause to take away from this meeting, I think, or from this panel. When you think about procuring cause, procuring cause starts with the close and works backwards and looks for the most complete chain, unbroken chain of communication and drive. It doesn't start with first introduction forward. It starts with transaction and works backwards, number one. Number two, New Jersey has some interesting laws about mediation and arbitration. And in different counties in the state of New Jersey, Arbitration is either all or nothing, or an arbiter can divide uh, portions of an award. And so if you are in an all or nothing county, for example, uh, Monmouth is an all or nothing county, and you're in a procuring cause, you may really want to give consideration to mediation instead of just digging your heels in for, uh, for arbitration. Because at, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to a panel of peers, people who practice real estate, that are making that decision. And procuring cause is a little bit gray. And the third thing I would say is always get a buyer's, get a stinking buyer's representation agreement. You are all professionals. None of you should be working for free. And none of you should be going out there and providing your services and spending thousands of dollars of your time, your knowledge, your your, uh, your well-being, your intellect, your experience, your resources on a hope and a prayer. Uh, when I practiced real estate, I never had a problem getting a buyer's agency agreement signed. Never. And I had to use them on a couple of occasions to, uh, to, to receive the commission that I was due for the work that I did. And so those are the three things I'd say about procuring costs. I think the most common misconception about procuring cause is that it is simply the first person to show that buyer the house. And it's so much more than that. And I think that's what everybody just needs to understand. We do have a question uh, in the chat that came up or in the Q&A. Um, it says, how does the panel determine procuring cause if a client has two agents? Because that happens a lot, we talked about. 
um, and the property was shown by only one agent. This happens a lot. Does the agent need to give the other agent a referral? So obviously that goes to mediation as far as if it's more of a referral, but where do you go with that if only one yeah, agent shows the property? I mean, procuring cause looks at the transaction at the close and works its way backwards, looking for the most unbroken chain of communication. And so that's in the mindset, that's what you have to think about is, can you make the argument that you truly were the person who created this transaction, who saw this transaction through the most? And when you're, I would tell an agent, if you're considering that, if you have any question about it, you should really put yourself into the other agent's shoes and ask yourself, what did that agent do, probably do, and, and do they really have a firm cause for this? And let that be a deciding factor between mediation and arbitration. So I think, um, you know, we talked about that you can't file an actual complaint for it until after the transaction closes. But what can we recommend to brokers and to agents that are watching this as far as how do we nip this in the bud before it even gets to the closing. So, you know, you think that you're entitled to it. Someone else thinks that they're entitled to it. Should you have that conversation with your broker beforehand and say, hey, can you call this other broker and talk to them and say, how can we work this out? So maybe that referral situation can be worked out or maybe you're putting them on notice that when this transaction does close, it does close we will be filing a complaint against this. Do we recommend those things or yes, where, yes, where do we stand with that? Yes, I definitely think that you should talk to the other broker or the other agent if you have a problem because sometimes it can resolve before it goes any further. If it can't, well, then you always have the next step. So you're saying talk to them before it closes. You know, Absolutely. if you're just having a conversation, talk to them before it closes. Come on notice. Yeah. 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 Remember, listen, from the association standpoint, from Mammoth Ocean Regional Realtors standpoint, I will 100% tell every agent in this association Always talk to your broker. Get your broker involved. The transaction, the listing belongs to the broker. And if you can't get hold of your broker, that's a question you ought to be asking yourself. Uh, because your broker is there for a partner. New Jersey real estate law has rules around your broker's involvement. And so get your broker involved from the beginning. And by the way, if you have, if you think it's going to close and you need to take action, talk, have your broker talk to legal counsel about steps that you could take legally in that transaction to not stop the transaction, but protect the commission distribution. But your lawyer has to get involved in that. The association does not. And to Brian's point about engaging with the broker, if someone reaches out to you and says that there seems to be a conflict here um, and it's two months before it closes. Like it's literally once it goes under contract and it's 60 days or 45 days or whatever, have the courtesy because we owe a professional courtesy to the people that we work with to yes. respond to those emails or text messages or voicemails. Call that other broker back and try to have a conversation with them because we had one recently where it was over a two month period and it was about money. And the broker that did not get any response from the other broker, she was more annoyed and pissed off that no one had responded to her. And that's when it escalates. So if you sort of acknowledge it, look, we're gonna close this, it's gonna close in our brokerage, but let's have a conversation during the time. You may never even get to mediation or a complaint being filed. Pick up the phone and call the people, answer an email. I know we're all very, very busy and we get 5,000 emails a day. But when another broker reaches out to you and says, we've got a dispute here on this A, B, and C, respond to that. Even if you're not going to agree to anything, at least open up that, that line of communication and you'd be surprised at what you can make go away. Communication is so key in general. And like we were discussing earlier with a lot, 99% of the time, it's the buyers putting us in this situation. It's also a great thing to bring back to your agents and your offices that how important buyer consultations are, not just running out and showing a house. Because even when you, if, when you explain it to a buyer quickly, they definitely don't get it. Even when you explain it to them in great detail, they still sometimes don't get it, but it doesn't 
we can at least start with explain, explaining the process because how many times have we all gotten calls from other agents, um, excuse me, from other buyers that say, oh my, you know, can I see this property? And when you engage in a little bit more conversation with them, you realize that it was just because their agent wasn't available at the time. And uh, we could have that conversation with buyers and explain the process through a buyer's consultation. It won't eliminate the situations we're in, but it might maybe, you know, make them a little bit less. Absolutely. Well, um, I don't think that we have any other questions in the q and I don't know if anybody has anything else that they want to add. Um, I know, Brian, you wanted to mention our new um, dues. Do you want to talk about that or you want to save that for another topic? Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, since we have managers on, and, uh, on the phones uh, and on this call, I'll tell you really quickly, don't forget MLS billing comes out. A bill will come out on May 2nd. Bills are due June 1st. Um, just every, same thing as last year, same every year they're due. I will tell you this year, and by the way, there's uh, several directors on this call, a couple. Uh, your directors, board of directors, have authorized a $75 discount on your MLS fee this year for doing nothing more than paying it on time. Uh, for paying your bill by 70, uh, you're, you'll get a $75 discount by doing nothing more than paying your bill by June 1st. Um, it's part of our association uh, performance uh, discount, our, our practice of giving back to our members, uh, back to, in this case, participants and subscribers as well. Uh, and then uh, start watching next month, the consumer website launches next month as well. And so uh, we're excited about that and the potential for leads for our uh, our agents. And so um, uh, by the way, uh, leads at no cost as a member benefit back to our agents, uh, no, no additional charges to you. So, um, yeah, I'm here at the office. If you have any questions, give me a call. Thank you. Thank you all. This was great. Um, I'm seeing people saying good information. Thank you. So, um, I appreciate all of your time in on this and, um, a final happy birthday to my co-chair Dawn. Happy birthday. Enjoy the rest of your day. And um, you guys go out and do something fun this weekend and sell some houses. <laughs> and and uh, also don't forget, you heard the recordings being um, done. If you were on this, you'll also be able to share some of this at your office meetings with the recordings that Lauren has been taking care of. So hopefully um, this will be helpful for your next office meeting. Excellent. Thanks guys. Hope this helps uh, keep you guys out of trouble. <laughs> Bye.